It's terrific to welcome to the program today Richard Dawkins, a renowned evolutionary biologist who has really revolutionized our understanding of genes, memes and the origins of life. Uh, he's also the host of the podcast, The Poetry of Reality, with Richard Dawkins available on YouTube, and we will be certain to link to that. I really appreciate your time, and it's, it's so great to have you on today. It's a pleasure. So maybe to start, you know, you've done so many interviews over the decades. I've reviewed so many of them in preparation for our discussion today to start with something maybe timely and then work back into some of some of your other work. We are seeing in the United States and also elsewhere this new uh, it's not new, but we're seeing a new wave of attempts to ban certain books, to challenge the validity of certain books, to contest or question whether in some cases children, in some cases high school students, in some cases even beyond that should be, quote, exposed to certain materials. Can you talk a little bit about whether you see this as a new wave of what, for example, led to the fatwa against Salman Rushdie? Is this a different phenomenon? How do you see it? I'm not sure I know what you're talking about. Maybe this is an American phenomenon. Um, <laughs> what is this new trend you're talking about? Well, in places like Florida and elsewhere, there are lists of books that have been uh, submitted to be banned, removed from school libraries, uh, told to teachers and librarians you are not allowed to or it would be damaging to children to teach. The That's the general trend I'm referring to. OK, are any of my books on the list? <laughs> you know, not on the list I've seen. That's a shame. I'd rather <laughs> enjoy that. It is good publicity in some sense uh, for, for one's books to be on that list, I'm sure. What, which books are on the list that I ought to know about? That you ought to know about is harder for me to say, but it's all it's it's books that teach history uh, of the United States in certain ways that may paint certain chapters of American history in a less than favorable light. It's sometimes books where characters are gay or bisexual, for example, or these. So it, it's it's really quite a quite a gamut that it runs. I see. Well, I'm strongly against any kind of censorship of that kind. So that that's that's your answer to the question uh, to, to 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 delve a little further into the idea. Um, you are someone who so many times has debated those with whom you vehemently disagree, whether it's their views about the Bible or <laughs> empiricism or whatever the case may be. My understanding of your work generally has been that sunlight is a useful disinfectant in many cases. At the same time, there's now a discussion being had about, for example, to make it timely, should empiricist scientists, doctors debate anti vaccine individuals? Is it good to take their views head on versus are they given a sort of legitimacy through these debates that may be more damaging? I watched some of your recent conversation with Russell Brand, and although I agree with your perspective of, of completely, I don't know that it went extraordinarily well from the standpoint of changing the minds of his audience, for example. What, what's your sense of this? I've had to wrestle with this earlier about creationists, because um, once again, the problem is should you give them a platform by um, agreeing if a real scientist appears with a creationist, it kind of makes it look as though there's a sort of level playing field. Yes. Um, that um, somehow there's a, there's a debate to be had. And um, on the other hand, um, it it's, can be seen as a bit patronizing if you don't. And so I, I find it a very difficult question. Um, on the whole, I've decided that I will not debate against creationists, at least not naive young earth creationists. And I um, I took that actually on advice of Stephen Jay Gould, who's normally thought to be a bit of an enemy of mine, but um, we agree about that. And he he advised me strongly not to, not to do it, not to uh, give them the platform. Now, um, vaccine deniers, um, I suppose that is a, a, a debate that, that we ought to be having because it is very, very widespread. I mean, vaccine deniers, de denial is a very widespread thing and it influences a lot of people. Um, 
there are possibilities of presidential candidates being strong vaccine deniers. So I think it is a debate we really do need to have. Um, and um, I'm not the best qualified to do that, but um, epidemiologists and doctors, um, I think, probably need to get out there and have that debate. One of the I don't know if criticisms, but maybe cautionary warnings that's often issued in any of these contexts is that these debates, by <laughs> virtue of their structure, it often ends up that whoever is most charismatic and articulate rather than whoever is empirically correct appears to win, for lack of a better term. Is that a problem that is the structure of these conversations or is it something bigger? I think it's a big problem. I, I think that's correct. Um, and uh, we've seen it again in, in the creationism, especially as many people are just ignorant of what the facts are. And so if somebody sounds plausible and has a loud voice, um, they are apt to win the argument, although they haven't really won it. They're apt to, to apparently uh, win the argument. Um, in the case of the vaccination debate, I think I was a possibly, I forget wh whether I said this to Russell Brand, but I have said it to somebody else, that I may have been a little bit too gung-ho earlier on in taking on board the doctrine which applies to many other vaccines, for example, the measles vaccine, the M MMR vaccine, that getting vaccinated is a public altruistic act. Because if you do not get vaccinated, then you are part of the problem of the spread of the epidemic. And now that's true of other diseases such as measles. Yes. But it's possibly not true of COVID. And I'm I've heard conflicting replies to my question about that. There's absolutely no doubt that vaccination against COVID is effective. That's not in question. That's true. Yes. What may not be necessarily true is that to refrain from getting vaccinated is itself an antisocial act for epidemiological reasons. That that may not be entirely true. Yeah, I mean, I think the truth of that has also shifted from the first vaccine tailored to the original variant where it seemed from the data that indeed it did prevent infection and transmission to these later variants and later vaccines, where it seems quite effective at preventing one's own more serious case of covid, but maybe not effective at preventing transmission. I, I feel like the problem comes where if our counterparts in these discussions are operating in bad faith, where they were saying it wasn't effective from the beginning, exactly. we end up almost having to appear to to backpedal because the facts have changed. Yes. And because we are honest. Yes. To some degree, because we are honest. You know, I, I'm wondering, I reviewed some of your older debates that you did with young earth creationists. There there was a woman whose name I now don't remember, but it's quite a highly viewed debate that's on YouTube that you probably did 20 years ago from a from an, uh, a young earth creationist organization is your view. Do you feel that your opponents in whatever debates you are engaging in have either declined in intellectual rigor over the last 20 or 30 years or have operated in increasingly bad faith over the last 20 or 30 years? Or has that not been a change that you've observed? I think you're thinking of Wendy Wright. Is Wendy that, is Wright. That's that exactly right. <clears throat> that's exactly right. Um, I'm not much of an observer of of changing the changing scene. I wouldn't like to say whether the, whether over 20 years um, things have changed. Um, I, as I said, I don't really do debates anymore um, on that subject. So I haven't really the experience to answer that question. And I haven't looked at any data. Is your sense more broadly that there is a difference today at least when it comes to the expectations of scientists like you and others, when it comes to balancing what is empirically true and what is socially or culturally acceptable to say, maybe I'm sort of getting at either political correctness or whatever phrase we want to apply, have have scientists had to adapt to a different environment in the publishing and discussion of their work? 
I fear they have. I, I think that this is true of some scientific journals, actually lots of scientific journals, um, notably Nature, Science, Scientific American, where um, editorial policy has swung in a very political direction to the point where scientists have to conform to a kind of political orthodoxy which almost amounts to a religion. Hmm. And um, this, I think, goes against the spirit, the open spirit of science, which I've always treasured throughout my scientific career. And I do feel that this is a very bad retrograde tendency. What is the, in your opinion, right way to fight that? Is it, you know, some will say it's simply to keep saying the truth and to fight. But the truth is that once you're really in the middle of it, that can be easier said than done. Jobs can be at stake, so on and so forth. What is the right way to push back against that? Well, obviously, my first thought is that the right way is to present the evidence. But if on if you if if you're a young assistant professor or a young postdoc or something, yes, who is in danger of losing your job, losing your grant, losing your colleagues, if you speak out. And one hears horror stories of uh, this happening. Um, it's a tragedy if people do, do have to self-censor. And I feel it's a responsibility for people like me who are retired and no longer have a job to lose to speak out on their behalf. At least in some theoretical sense, tenure would be a protection for those who are currently employed rather than retired. But there's also criticisms of tenure. Uh, at institutions of higher learning. Do you have a position on the role of tenure in either in enabling these conversations or not? Not really. I mean, I, I think it's it's something that w w once you've been promised something, you should people should not renege on that pro on that promise. So if you if you've been given tenure in good faith, then that should not be under undermined. It, that, it should be it should be upfront in in other words that 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 tenure doesn't actually mean tenure right no without 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 a doubt um let me switch gears a little bit i was watching the trailer for the new podcast the po uh, poetry of reality with richard dawkins and i noted that the voiceover from the trailer is uh, quite a similar uh, uh, uh script of sorts from your 1998 book unweaving the rainbow and one of the interesting things that's often brought up to me and, and to others is that sometimes the view of folks like you and others is that when you remove some kind of biblical story, God creation story, et cetera, you're left with a sort of nihilistic pessimism. There's no meaning and purpose, et cetera. And you've talked about this before, that much of the meaning is the meaning we assign rather than what some arbitrary text assigns or whatever the case may be. Can you talk about that a little bit in the sense that what's concerning to me is when I hear an argument from a religious individual that says, how can you really prove to me murder is wrong if you don't have some text to tell you that my reaction always is you're telling me the only thing preventing you from murder is some religious text. I mean, it, it seems as though there's another side to that argument, isn't there? Yes. And um, well, coming to the first point first, um, uh, you're perfectly right, of course, that the script of the Poetry of Reality tra trailer is straight from my book, um, Unweaving the Rainbow. And that entire book is about the poetry of science. It's a, it's about the, the what nonsense it is to say that science somehow is nihilistic, is somehow takes away from the poetry, the romance of, well, the spirituality, actually, if, in one sense of, of science. So, yes, that, that's the answer to, to that. Now, the thing about if you don't believe in God, what's to stop you murdering? I mean, if anybody says that, I think it was Herb Silverman said, I'm going to step away from you. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're not the kind of person I, I would like to know. If that's the only reason why you don't go around murdering people is that you're frightened of God. What a terrible, terrible re reason that is, what a terrible basis for morality that is. If that's what you call morality, then I don't wish to know you. Yeah, I mean, it gets to often this conversation of the moral relativism and the idea that anything that can be science's best approximation 
simply is not as definitive at some kind of prescribed set of rules, the likes of which we get from from religion. Now, I would say that's a virtue of science and the fact that it only goes as far as what can be demonstrated and not beyond. And sometimes it may not feel as prescriptive, but there are those who say it simply doesn't feel as definitive or as strong to me. Well, they may, they may say that. I mean, I, I think that um, morality, what's right and wrong, is something we have to discuss. It's something which um, actually does evolve um, in uh, on a cultural scale, on, a, on, on the scale of cultural evolution. It evolves over the centuries. And what we take to be morality today is very different from what it was 100 years ago, 200 years ago, even a few decades ago, actually. Um, I've called it the shifting moral zeitgeist. And it's manifestly the case that um, not that long ago, just about everybody was racist, just about everybody was sexist, and, and we're not anymore. And this, things are moving in the right direction. And it's quite mysterious, but nevertheless obviously true, that things are moving in the right direction. I'm not clear what's going on. I'm not clear what it is. One can use a phrase like it's something in the air, something hovering in the air, but it's we mustn't get mystical about that it's it's something it's a it's an amalgam it's a combination of oh um parliamentary discussion judicial decisions um just plain conversations in pubs in dinner parties in 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 um courts of law in journalism in newspapers in books something changes as the decades go by such that our moral standards move in a consistent direction. And that direction has absolutely nothing to do with scripture, far from it. I mean, thank goodness it doesn't, I mean, because if we, if, we lived, if we lived our moral lives by scripture, we'd be stoning adulteresses to death and things like that. And speaking of which, you mentioned moving in the right direction. Um, Steven Pinker and others have been criticized for laying out the perspective that by applying some very uh, um, objective measures, uh, infant mortality, life expectancy, likelihood of dying in a war, et cetera, that it number of people living in abject poverty, that things are better than ever. And one of the um, big counterpoints to that has been while that may be true, our standards and expectations for particularly Western democracies and rich nations should have actually been raised so dramatically that it's not necessarily the big win someone like Pinker points out to say, OK, there's fewer people living on the equivalent of a dollar a day now that we're actually failing to solve solvable problems, hunger, for example, or whatever the case may be. Is your view more in one direction or the other or more in between a balanced view? Is the point you're making that it's uh, the danger of becoming complacent because of um, a book like Pinker's saying things are getting better, therefore we don't need to, to work to make them even better still. Is that, that the point? May, I, I don't know that that's my argument, but I'm, I'm sort of um, voicing those who say that the measures may not actually be the right measures for how we evaluate how well things are going for homo sapiens are on planet Earth. Well, I think we obviously need to try to make things better still. But I think um, Stephen Pinker's one of his main points is that we are so pessimistic and the kind of thing that gets reported as news is always bad news. And, and you never get a, a, a news headline that, that, that says something positive because it's kind of boring. It's not not a thing that journalists are interested in. Yeah, I'm on a list of good news stories, and very often you can look at them and say, that's great news. It will never get attention because it's usually something along the lines of uh, breast cancer survivability over the last 15 years has incre increased 38 percent. That's yes. extremely tangible, meaningful for uh, people who get sick and their families and loved. It, it's extraordinarily meaningful, and it makes a terrible news headline for for profit media. I mean, one reason for that is that it's not a sudden thing. It's a, it's it's a, it's a it's a gradual trend. Yes. Um, and it, I suppose, if there were a sudden breakthrough, a sudden discovery, that that made breast cancer survival dramatically improve on overnight, then I, I guess that would count as news. When it comes to a 
more specifically now in terms of progress versus regression, the threat of Christian nationalism uh, in the United States and around the world. And this group that while maybe 30 years ago they felt the same way, they were a little more coy and slick about how they expressed it, where now we actually have elected officials in the United States who openly say this should be a Christian nation. Christian nationalism is correct. The Christian doctrine should actually determine civil government and how our society is organized. Has your view of the threat of that movement intensified since you wrote, for example, The God Delusion? I am a, a distant observer of the American scene, and I and I notice that um, people that the Christian nationalists you're talking about simply lie about the uh, Constitution and about the um, in, intentions of the founding fathers. It's they do. absolutely clear that, that, that they are telling untruths. Um, it, it's it's very different over here, of course, because we we genuinely are. I mean, in, in Britain, we are founded in 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 Christianity in the sense that the um, well, the, the monarch is the head of the Church of England, for example. Yes. Um, this is a historical accident. It, it has an oddly paradoxical effect, which is that it kind of makes religion boring. It's 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 not a it's not a big problem in the way that it is in in America. It's, I think pre precisely because in America. Um, it's not an established religion. It's it's something that's open to free enterprise to to um, compete over. Therefore, religion is kind of exciting. You have ch church, these great big churches with people waving their arms around and, and dancing and things. We don't have that here, not much anyway. And it's, I think it's partly because we do have an established church. Yeah, you know, when I speak to, to my Italian friends, they are always very quick to say, oh, no, 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 our, our elected officials are Catholic. I'm Catholic. My family's Catholic. And when you probe a little bit about what that means for their beliefs and their everyday life, it means very little in the way of policymaking the way that it does in the United States. And, and I belief also if you if you said to them, do you actually believe in the transubstantiation? Do you actually believe that the, the wine becomes the blood of Christ? They probably don't. They probably don't even realize what it is to be Catholic. They just they're born Catholic. They're baptized Catholic. They're confirmed Catholic. And so they think they are Catholic, but they don't really believe it. In that sense, as someone who's been a very strong critic of organized religion, do you find that version, for example, of Catholicism that I describe or what you're describing in England? Is it relatively benign or is it only benign in that it's not really the type of religion in that that it sometimes claims to be like you're saying it's not maybe really Catholicism? I think it is relatively benign when I stress the word relatively. Um, I mean, when you think of the competition, when you think of Islam, um, I, I, I'm sometimes inclined to agree with Ayan Hirsi Ali that, that, that in certain parts of the world, at least we need Christianity as a, as a sort of buttress against against something worse. And Hilaire Belloc's line, always keep a hold of nurse for fear of finding something worse. Mm. I mean, Christianity is bad enough, but it's not the worst religion around. Is that is is that clear in your mind, this sort of ranking of the risk posed by different religions? I think it is pretty clear. I mean, Christianity was so appalling in the Middle Ages, and and um, it's kind of had quite a few centuries to grow up, and so I think that there is a possibility of ranking there. Yes. Do you? I mean, what what does that what does that landscape look like to you? Well, I mean, in, it's one of the doctrines of Islam that the penalty for apostasy is death. Well, that's. I think even the most fervent Christian nationalist wouldn't can, wouldn't say that somebody who renounces Christianity should be killed. No, I've had Christians on my show who say gays should be killed, which I don't know if it's better or worse. Uh, well, that's, it's about equally bad, but I would say but, so. Um, but um, it, but it, it, that's not a, that's not a religion anyway. Well, it, it may be it may be fermented by religion, but it's it's not actually saying if you give up Christianity, you should be killed. No, that's certainly true. Think, Do you think that I mean, you, you know, what, whenever this conversation is had, someone will invariably say, oh, well, what about Buddhism? Here's a bunch of very peaceful things about Buddhism. And then someone will come back and say, well, OK, but then 
Here's some other stuff about Buddhism that maybe is actually a little more concerning. Do you do you concern yourself with looking into the details of some of the smaller religions relatively and going down the list further and further? Or is that no, not really I, I, a concern? I haven't really done much of that. No, I don't. I, 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 I'm not that keen on giving a kind of rank order. Fair. No, I think I that uh, I, I think that that's fair. Um, let's talk about one more general area in the time that uh, that that we have left. Uh, you've said many things over the last two years related to the discussion about uh, gender and transgender and gender identity, et cetera, some of which you've said that I agree with and some of which you've said that that maybe I agree with a little less. One of the most interesting things that I heard over the last few months was Neil deGrasse Tyson in a conversation with a, a right wing person from the United States say, listen, um, there are all sorts of, of conversations and debates to be had about this issue and the connection to whether it's mental illness or whether it's uh, age appropriateness of certain decisions that are made, et cetera. Can we all agree that gender is expressed on a spectrum? And what I found interesting about Neil deGrasse Tyson saying this is that it's less a conversation about biology and sex and genitalia. But it is a question about what I think is an undeniable reality about about the world, which is at minimum, the expression of gender is on a spectrum and that maybe that can serve as a starting point for some of these discussions. Would you agree with that, which seems to me like an uncontroversial statement or, or is that a problematic statement to you? I'm a biologist and uh, what I really object to is the subversion of language mm. talking about a woman's penis, for, for, for example. I mean, that is just pl playing around, playing fast and loose with the English language. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm a biologist who, who needs to talk about sex uh, and the difference between male and female, which is absolutely clear. It's one of the very few binaries we actually have in biology. Um, race is not a binary. Race is a, cont a genuine continuum, obviously, because of all hybridization and so on. Um, almost everything else you can think of is a continuum, short versus tall, fat versus thin. Um, all, all those things are, are a continuum. Sex is the one thing which actually is a binary. And um, I think that uh, messing around with the English language and well, any any language for that matter, but mm. I to speak English, um, is a subversion, a perversion of clarity of thought, clarity of of speech for political ends. Yeah, and I think most of my progressive colleagues would agree that the it, the biological circumstances undeniably are men, women, some percentage born intersex. And that's tiny, a, tiny. Percentage, yes, no, certainly percentage. no need to exaggerate what the percentage is. No. is. Is it also in your mind a problem to separate biological sex and gender expression? Do you have an issue? Language aside, is that a concern to you? I am not particularly bothered if somebody wants to present themselves as the opposite of the sex that they are. I do object if they insist that other people recognize that. And I mean, I, I support Jordan Peterson in this, if nothing else, that mm. he objects to the Canadian government making it mandatory that he should call people by a pronoun like they um, when they are. I mean, he's, he's prepared to do that as a matter of courtesy but not as a matter of compulsion. And I thoroughly support him on that. You know, I don't have the bill in front of me, but when I looked at it 18 months ago, I struggled to find anywhere where you know, he talks about threat of jail. If you use the wrong pronoun, I did not find that. But since I don't have it in front of me, maybe we'll we'll table the, the those particulars. Um, but that being said, what about, for example, things like arresting doctors who provide certain um, gender affirming care, as it's called. Maybe you have an issue with the term or, or, or not. But what about the arresting of doctors, for example? Does that not start to bite a little <laughs> bit to oh, which, sorry, which doctors have have doctors been arrested for that? No, these are bills that have been proposed in the United States. It has not happened to my knowledge, fortunately. Uh, children or, or adults? We've seen both in different states. Well, I would have um, 
I would have a strong objection to doctors um, uh, injecting minors, ch children, or performing surgery on, on them to change their sex. And as far as adults, you have no issue. Well, um, I think if if it's if if they've thought about it properly, like um, some like um, Jan Morris, for example, who, who I, I read years ago, one of the first of the of trans people that I read and greatly respected her uh, her, the, her struggle that she went through in order to um, change sex from male to female. She really, really put herself through it and clearly sincere, clearly suffered from from gender dysphoria, no doubt about that. And 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 I take my hat off to her and to the doctors who helped her. But I fear that what we're seeing now is a fashion, a craze, um, a, 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 a mimetic epidemic, um, which is which is uh, which is spreading like an epidemic of, of measles or something like that. Yeah, I mean, listen, we're obviously we're not going to resolve this today, but I, I think, you know, I share some of the concerns I've seen you share with regard to uh, children, with regard to questions about uh, some of these um, tr uh, treatments, et cetera. And I think that these should all be questions that should be had and, and asked and answered in good faith with data and empiricism. And I also can't help but see that trans people and also trans kids have become a very ugly scapegoat of a movement that 15 years ago was mostly targeting gay men. And so my desire would be and you tell me if you think it's possible that we can ask all of these questions in good faith while making it clear we're not looking to discriminate against individuals, subject them to whatever it was that uh, other groups were previously subjected to and hopefully get to a place of understanding. But unfortunately, do you agree that this has become a scapegoated group? I what I see is that there's a, a in effect a war going on between between gay people and trans people, or at least not trans people themselves, but tra but, but trans activists. Mm. So I'm not I'm not sure that I, I follow that. I think I think that um, I, I have great sympathy and great respect for gay people. And uh, I, I worry about the bullying that goes on, uh, uh, not by trans people themselves or necessarily, but by some of the activists. I mean, there was somebody in Britain, I think, just a couple of days ago, who stood up and made a speech. It was actually a, a trans person, a, a man turned turned woman, who said, "If you see a turf, punch her in the fucking face." Oh, so in other words, you, if I understand correctly, you have some concerns about LGBT and whether or not trans really is part of the LGB movement or something different. Well, I think there are there, there's been a recent court case in in Britain um, where, where an an LGB l lobby was fighting against a T lob lobby. So I'm not there's, familiar there's, with that case, but I'm aware of that disagreement certainly. So that is a concern to you. Yes. Interesting. Um, all right, Richard Dawkins. There there's no appropriate time to cut a conversation, but let's cut it now because we are at the end okay. of our time. We will be linking to your uh, to your podcast. I really appreciate your time and insights, and I, I know you're very busy. Thank you very much.